fly And the sun is shining down on the valley Hope to be a fly wish to the day that I die Spring has thawed out the long bitter winter The water is clear and the skies are blue I'm standing in the middle of the beaver kill river Might even catch and release one or two Yes, fishing is a favorite pastime of mine. If I couldn't do it, I think I would cry. Well, life is good when I'm wading a river. It gets even better when I cast a fly. If I catch a trout, it don't really matter. It's fun just to be here and give it a try. And my waders leave, and it's raining now on my favorite stream. Welcome to Bio 111. My name is Mark Demetrius and I'm an Associate Professor of Biology Department at BCC. And today we have a, an exciting field trip planned for you today and uh, uh, the focus uh, today is going to be on bog ecology. Behind me you'll see a very, very unique habitat. Uh, it's a type of habitat that's formed due to glaciers and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. I'd also like to uh, introduce Dr. Troy Jesse. Uh, he's walking down along the area here. and. Uh, he's also a member of the biology department, and uh, together with the with the two of us, we're going to uh, share some really interesting stuff about uh, today's uh, today's lab, bog succession. What we have, uh, what we're standing on right here, is kind of a, a, a area of higher elevation. This area is referred to as a came, uh, and this came formed, believe it or not, some 10,000 years ago. Uh, about 22,000 years ago, glaciers made it to their maximum destination, which was down about uh, the region of Long Island, uh, and also came back through in the Hazleton area in Pennsylvania. And uh, it started to recede as climatic ch uh, changes took place on a global level. Uh, it slowly started to recede and eventually made its way to this region uh, right here. Uh, if you happen to be standing in this location 22,000 years ago, uh, you folks would have been covered by a sheet of ice which was approximately one mile thick. So uh, to get the top of that glacier you'd have to burrow a hole straight up. 5,280 feet. Amazing. Uh, although 22,000 years later, totally different circumstances, totally different habitat, uh, we're going to uh, uh, share those unique features and how this beautiful habitat uh, formed. So we know that this region uh, formed about 10,000 years ago and, and right about at that time the face of the glacier was right here uh, and a glacier of course is a river of, uh, of ice and as cracks and crevices form in the face of that glacier huge chunks of ice shear off the face of that glacier and wham hit the ground around us. Uh, that process is, is called calving and uh, it's that process of calving that created this bowl that you see right here. Uh, what I'm standing on is once again a layer of higher ground, the came, and as that chunk of ice laid on the surface of the ground, uh, glacial till, you folks call it gravel, filled up around that massive ice cube. As that uh, massive chunk of ice melted, the ground gave, 
and form this bowl right here, which is the most unique feature to a bog I probably can tell you uh, today. This border of higher ground prevents the outflow of water and it also prevents the uh, uh, inflow of water. So there's no inlet nor outlet uh, on a bog except for evaporation and precipitation. Because of that feature, the water here is stagnant and uh, water that is stagnant uh, loses the oxygen that's found in that water. So we have very much anaerobic setting here. Once you go below this vegetation, there's water, no fish, no creatures that depend on extracting oxygen from, uh, from the water. Uh, once we get out there, you'll see just how massive a chunk of ice this must have been. With anaerobic conditions, no inlet, no outlet, uh, the soil is very acidic. Uh, organic acids will leach out of, of the vegetation that dies. Uh, because it's acidic, we don't find uh, a very important or critical component, a uh, type of bacteria known as our saprophytes. Uh, without our saprophytes, decomposition doesn't take place and the recycling of nutrients isn't possible. So anaerobic conditions, poor nutrients, uh, very little recycling. Because of that, the vegetation out here grows extremely. It's a very slow process. So succession, based on what we've talked about in the past as far as field succession in a temperate uh, deciduous forest, totally different here. Um, anything else you'd like to add as far as uh, unique features. I was going to add some more when we got outside. Sure, that's fine. Uh, let's see. One of the things that we want to focus on is uh, uh, some of the variables that have played a role uh, that would trigger a glacial event. Uh, the beginning of the Quatern Quaternary period started about two million years ago and all the evidence supports that glaciation started about that time. Uh, plate tectonics played a role, ocean currents played a role, gas levels in the atmosphere played a role. Uh, but in 1941, an astronomer by the name of Milankovitch really outlined three main variables that played a role in, in the triggering of these events. And uh, they are known as Milank Milankovitch cycles as a result. What we have found is that, uh, and what Milankovitch has outlined, is that uh, uh, the position of the planet in relation to the sun is not always at a constant. Uh, we know that the, the, the planet revolves around the sun and at certain times, geologic, geologically speaking, at certain times that pattern is more circular and much more stable. And in other times, that orbit is more elliptical. And to go from its most circular pattern to its most elliptical pattern, uh, takes thousands of years and uh, obviously the closer you are to the sun the more UV radiation the farther away the more likely you are to experience a glacial phenomenon. In addition to that axial tilt we know that currently the planet it's on its axis at 23.5 degrees. Uh, Milankovitch outlined that this also is not at a constant and it can vary from 21.5 degrees to 24.5 degrees. Obviously with the poles facing the sun at a more steep angle, that would allow more UV radiation to hit our poles at that time and glacial events aren't as likely. Um, so that also takes thousands of years to go from one extreme 21.5 to 24. Um, and the third Milankovitch cycle deals with uh, the rotation of the planet. And the best way I can uh, describe that, <clears throat> known as precession, if you were to take a quarter and spin it on a table and hold the top of that quarter, that coin cannot drift in 3D space. It's stuck right there. But that's not how our planet spins. If you were to take a quarter and spin it on the table, it will float around in a circular pattern. And that's exactly how our planet spins. And as it wobbles, it can get at certain times closer to the sun and farther away. Those three cycles right there are the, the key variables that play a role in gl glacial uh, events. Today we're talking about the greenhouse effect and carbon dioxide and so forth and so on. It is a player, but it's not as big a player come to find out, or at least currently. Uh, we don't believe it's as big a player as these other uh, issues. Axial tilt, the orbit and how it rotates, if it's circular, elliptical, all uh, key uh, factors. So this is quite literally a time capsule. This place has been here for 10,000 years and uh, because of the anaerobic 
state because of little de decomposition this area uh, really has very very slow progression of, of plant life uh, we're going to go down off the cane very soon and we're going to walk out across a mat of moss known as sphagnum moss all of the vegetation that we see growing it has actually taken root in uh, that sphagnum moss and uh, we're going to talk about some of the very unique uh, plants out there some of which are endangered um, they're endangered uh, unfortunately because that sphagnum moss that we're going out and walking on uh, has been harvested they dry it out and they make peat moss out of it so when they go out and take that sphagnum moss they have to dredge up all of these other rare plants and as a result some of these only found uh, in places like a bog have become uh, endangered so how about we walk down off the uh, off the cane We'll get out across that mat of sphagnum moss. If you were here, I guarantee you'd be getting your feet wet. So you see us stumbling and uh, uh, you know pulling the moss out of each other's hair. Uh, it happens. Biology is a study of life, and, and we love to get right uh, get our hands dirty. So come on along. Because of uh, all the rain that we've had this year, you would expect this place to be wet. Once again, the only inlet is uh, of water is precipitation, and uh, it is. And it's quite wet this year. <laughs> we're going to go out a little bit further, and uh, you'll see that more and more. Um, there's some unique vegetation that we want to point out as, as we've uh, uh, come to the edge of an open area of water. We're not quite there yet, but before we get there, uh, Dr. Jesse wants to talk about a few plants, one of which is a fern and also a moss that I, I, I mentioned earlier, so go ahead. As the bog develops, the sphagnum moss is the primary plant that grows here, and as it grows and dies, it builds up in layers. So what we're actually standing on here is a layer of detritus. This isn't soil, even though if you come out here and step on it and walk around and you smell it, it smells like dirt. If there's no uh, um, rock component to this whatsoever, it's all organic. If you look here toward the ground, these little bunches of small green plants, this is the sphagnum moss. This is the moss that probably is the most important plant in the bog. Everything else that grows out here grows because of this. And because of this, and due to the fact that there is no oxygen, uh, the decay of this plant causes some of the um, major characteristics that have led to the special adaptations and many of the plants we're going to look at as we head towards open water. All right. One of the plants that you'll find in this area is this particular fern here. It has very uh, long, very large fronds. They all come out of the ground at the same point. This particular fern is called a cinnamon fern. Okay, it likes these sort of acidic conditions. And you can also see here it's, it's quite shady. In addition, there are red maples and other types of pine trees here. They are also adapted to acidic conditions. Uh, anything else you'd like to add? Um, I think we have some no. blueberries towards the uh, yeah, opening. We're gonna, and We're going to come uh, to a point where there's a lot of blueberries in this time of year is when they're ripe and uh, we're going to eat a few along the way. So why don't we head down a little further and enjoy some of the fruit. We're back. We finally made it out to the uh, area where the vegetation usually is is pretty low to the ground and for that reason we'll be able to look out where that chunk of ice uh, once was laying on the, on the land but as I get to the edge where you know you get a little more sunlight we find a lot of shrubs uh, along here and uh, this time of year the fruit is ripe and uh, it's real good we call it wild blueberry mm. um, no sense in buying blueberries. Go pick them right here at the bog. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, spot this time of year. Once again, this particular plant is an acidophile. It loves acidic conditions. Um, not found in real shaded areas, but once again, it needs a certain amount of sunlight. Uh, around me, uh, there are several other different types of plants. This particular plant right here, you'll see uh, has a leaf which kind of has a leather texture to it and it's uh, 
uh, the edges of the leaf are rolled under, white on the underside. Uh, this is called Labrador tea. Uh, they refer to it as Labrador tea because it has a very spicy, the leaves can be used to make a very spicy tea, and it's very high in, uh, in vitamin C. Right below me, I don't know if you can see through uh, the sphagnum moss here, but you'll find a lot of green fruit right here all along the bog in front of me. Um, this fruit will turn uh, red in a couple months, and in the past we've used the bog to harvest this type of plant, uh, and uh, we prepare that fruit for Thanksgiving. Uh, we call it wild cranberry, cranberry sauce. So uh, also very unique to a bog type setting. As you look out to my right, your left, you'll find a grass growing that has cotton balls all over the top of them. This particular plant is, is referred to as cotton grass. Okay, another very unique plant to a bog. And then of course we have this plant, this small tree, normally is will get quite large. Uh, in the background you'll see some larger ones growing. You'll see uh, this particular plant has tufts of needles. They'll have 15, 20, 30 in a bunch. And uh, this plant is the only tree that grows in North America has needles and it's deciduous. Uh, in about four months or so the needles will turn yellow, they'll all fall off the tree, and you would swear that this tree would be dead. It's not. Next spring you come back and the foliage will be back again. It's the only North American uh, needle-bearing tree that is, that is deciduous. It's not just found on a bog, but we find it here. Lori, would you like to point out some of the uh, unique insectivorous uh, plants? We have plants here that, uh, that uh, uh, feed, if you will, on insects. Now recall, due to the lack of oxygen, decay here happens very, very slowly. Because of that, there are very few nutrients for plants to acquire, so they have some evolved some unique adaptations in order to acquire uh, certain nutrients, such as proteins. If you look here at the base of this larch, you're going to see some small plants that look like pitchers. These are pitcher plants. Inside the pitcher plant, uh, these uh, collect rain, and there's water and digestive enzymes in this liquid. On the inside of this lip, there are tiny hairs that point downward. So as an insect crawls down, it has no problem. It smells something sweet, it wants nectar, but if it tries to get back out, it's trapped, it can't get out, it falls into this liquid in the bottom of the cup, and it's digested by the plant. It provides nutrients for the pitcher plant. And here, near the pitcher plant, is a very small, but I think very beautiful, insectivorous plant. It's called a sundew. Okay, it has these flattened leaves that have small, sticky hairs that project from the leaf. Insects will climb on these leaves, once again, after the nectar on the ends of the, of the hairs. They act like glue. They trap the insects. The leaves will curl up, and once again, enzymes will digest the insects, providing nutrients for the plant. So some really, really neat adaptations, some spectacular evolution by these plants to survive in a habitat really where not many things can survive and thrive as these do. Great. Uh, we, walk, we walked in from the cane a moment ago and uh, this taller vegetation behind me, uh, we walked down this path, it's about 70, 80 yards to the cane. So the perimeter where this taller vegetation, uh, there's quite a bit there. Uh, back behind you, uh, we will find an open body of water and uh, we're going to reposition here and show you just how large that sheet of or that chunk of ice must have been uh, before it melted. Okay, so let's go out a little bit further. feet are getting a little wet. We're getting out to the, the central region and you can see behind me where we have some open water and it just gives you an idea of how large that 
that chunk of ice must have been. Now keep in mind it's quite deceiving because the taller trees around us uh, kind of obscure how large that uh, chunk of ice must have been. Once again, the chunk of ice had a diameter of probably 150, 180 yards wider than what you see out here in the open region. Um, of course, you have to go back to that location of the cane. Um, you have some water lilies that will grow out here. Um, and the vegetation, the sphagnum moss, actually grows out over the top of the water. And when you rock out here, it feels like walking on a waterbed. You stay in one location very long, that uh, water comes right through that moss like a sponge. And uh, my feet are quite wet right now. Um, one of the things that, uh, uh, once we're out here, if you take a look at that water, it's brown in color. And uh, uh, other or organics actually leach out into the water as, as time goes on. And uh, uh, the tannins, actually, mom may have said she's gonna tan your hide. Uh, basically, historically, tannins were used to tan leather goods. Uh, and you can see, if you had a gallon of water here, it would be quite brown in color. Troy, anything you want to add? Uh, no, except that I'm I'm a little bit shy to walk out that far. <laughs> the closer I get to the edge of the water, the more likely I'm going to get uh, a little wetter than I am right now. Uh, but this is just an amazing place. Now you have to think of succession <clears throat> from the cane. Ten thousand years ago, there was nothing here, nothing, and it has taken ten thousand years for vegetation to slowly collect and move out to this location right here. So uh, succession takes place in a very slow way. And if we utilize this sphagnum moss for peat moss, it's really not a renewable resource in our life. And of course, all these beautiful plants that we pointed out uh, that are unique to a bog, uh, they're destroyed in the process. So pitcher plants, sundews, and some of these others we mentioned, uh, they are uh, endangered. So I'm quite careful as to where I walk so I, I don't damage uh, any of these. Uh, uh, rare, rare plants. I did mention that we call this a quaking bog because the the the, uh, the sphagnum moss is floating quite literally uh, on the water. Oftentimes, students will ask me, "Well, how deep is this out here?" I, I really have no way of telling unless I were to jump in, and and that's not going to happen today anyway. Uh, but I would be willing to bet uh, that uh, if you go down. The, into the water and eventually get to a layer of organic material, detritus, you would still have to go probably another 100 feet or so before you actually uh, made your way to that, uh, uh, to that glacial till uh, that obviously blankets all of, uh, of New York State. But just a, an amazing place uh, and certainly has great value on, as far as beauty is concerned, as far as an educational uh, standpoint. And we've also used bogs uh, to learn about past climates. And because below the surface of the water is like a time capsule, any pollen, or anything for that matter, that falls into uh, the bog will be literally kept in a time capsule for thousands of years. So since this bog is approximately 10,000 years old, uh, any pollen grains that I would pick up off the bottom if I did a core sample, would be a time capsule of the type of vegetation that was around here 10,000 years ago, 8,000, 6,000, and so forth and so on. The study of pollen is, is known as pollenology, and, uh, uh, and uh, we've been able to determine past climates as a result. We know that the vegetation around us grows because of day length, because of temperature, because of humidity and, and precipitation and so forth and so on. And if we have a log, a 10,000 year log book, of the types of vegetation that, that grew around here, we would know how that uh, climate has fluctuated over time. Uh, yet again, another reason uh, to preserve such a unique uh, place. You know, a few years ago, front page of Discover Magazine showed an individual, a corpse, uh, that was uh, uh, dredged out of a bog, and they refer to these individuals as bog people. Since Canada, Scandinavian countries, and so forth and so on, has been heavily glaciated, many bogs, and uh, as they've gone in these bogs for the sphagnum moss, they've actually uh, dredged up humans from 5,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, and so forth and so on. And uh, uh, we've been able to study these individuals, 
since it's a time capsule and decay doesn't take place, uh, we know how they died. We know what they ate. Uh, uh, we may find that uh, there was a, a ritual as far as a burial site for these individuals. Individuals may have broken the law of the land and were executed. Uh, others may have sacrificed themselves to the gods and so forth and so on. So yet again, another uh, way uh, we can use bogs as an educational tool. In this case, it deals with anthropology, the study of, of man. We're going to start heading back. My, I'm starting to sink, so uh, bear with me here and uh, we'll slowly make our way off the bog and back onto the cane. Well, we finally made our way back off the bog and the two of us are sitting on the cane, the layer of higher, area of higher ground. Our feet are a little drier than a moment ago. Uh, to wrap up the lab today, I hope you've enjoyed the experience. Uh, but uh, following our footage here at the bog, you'll, you'll find a series of slides that uh, focus on uh, what we talked about today. And, and the video wraps up with a, uh, some objectives for you. Uh, those objectives focus on how this place formed, how old it is, unique abiotic factors that's unique to a bog. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, uh, slides of various different plants that we did identify out in the field, but we provided those slides for a little better uh, a visual aid for you. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the experience out here. Uh, it's been nice to stay out of the heat today. It's one of the hottest days to be here, and uh, to get out here in the you know cool environment was a, was a nice treat for all of us. Hope you've enjoyed it. Oh, the music! <laughs> <laughs>